Okay, so we're going to get uh, started. Uh, I'll lead with some good news, and that is that we have four class days until spring break. Not that I'm counting or anything. Um, so that's good. So two days this week, two days next week, then you guys are off for a week. Um, you got two handouts today. We'll get to exercise 114 in a little bit. Uh, but you got your assignment 104, which is Charlie Harper. Uh, we'll actually spend a little bit of time, I think it's next class, uh, you'll do some research on Charlie Harper and pick a kind of a precedent study that you're going to work with. Uh, and I'll show you some examples of, of Charlie Harper work. This is a project to be done in Illustrator. It's on an 8.5 by 11 size sheet, though if you feel like you want it to be a square, I'm okay with that. Or you want to adjust the proportions a little bit, that's okay. Um, basically, it's a, it's a drawing project using shapes. Um, we'll get into it in a little bit more detail. It is due on Wednesday the 27th, which essentially you should all be like, oh, thank you so much, because it's due right before spring break. And you have nothing to do over spring break. See, I'm one of those kind of teachers, so don't forget that, OK? Um, so it's due right before. You don't have to worry about it. You turn it in, or you do have to worry about it. You turn it in, and then you go on spring break, and life is good. Uh, hopefully, you're all going to wonderfully exciting exotic locations. And uh, then you'll come back all refreshed for the balance of the semester. Um, we're just under halfway. Uh, I think next class is the halfway point in the semester. So uh, it's a pretty good time to have a break. So anyway, um, we'll get to exercise 114 in a little bit, which is a bunch more in Illustrator. We'll do a little bit more work with Pen Tool, but we're going to work on the Pathfinder tool a lot more today. Uh, and so I'll walk you through that so you have a better understanding of how that works. But before we get into that, we're going to talk today about logo design. And as we've gone through the semester, there's a lot of repetition. We talked about graphic design. We talked about layouts. Now we're back in talking about logo design. The same kind of compositional strategies apply to logo design that they do to all the rest of photography. So there's always overlap in here. But I think logo design is particularly fun because it's something that we're presented with every day. You can't go anywhere without seeing logos. It's part of the way that we consume products. Uh, and so if you start to think of yourself a little bit as a product, you having a personal logo becomes an important thing because you're essentially starting to brand yourself. An effective logo is fundamentally distinctive. It's recognizable. It's something that's obvious. It's appropriate. It's practical. It's graphic. And generally, it's fairly simple in form. Some of the best logos are the simplest logos. Uh, and it conveys some kind of an intended message. Um, that one's a little bit tricky, because sometimes you just have to see a logo so much, and then all of a sudden you understand what it is. So here's a bunch that you see on a, on a daily basis, driving around, on your TV, et cetera. They're all distinct graphic shapes. They're all something that we recognize. We immediately see and we say, oh, I understand what that is. Simplicity is important. So we want easy recognition of a logo. The more complicated a logo is, the harder it is to remember it, and the harder it is for your brain to recognize it and say, oh, I know what that is, and then crave whatever that particular product is. Uh, it's versatile. It's memorable. Versatile and memorable are important because obviously you want to be able to remember what it is, but it also needs to be able to go a lot of places. You can take the Chevy logo, for example. It obviously has to go on a car, but it ends up on a lot of other things. Too. It might be on stationery, it might be on a business card, it might be a lot of other places. And so you have to think about where else is it going to go. And it might feature something that's a little bit unexpected or something that's unique. Some of the best logos out there, we'll get to some of those a little bit later, have something that's a little bit unique and different about it. This has absolutely nothing to do with coffee. Yet we all associate this logo with coffee. It's very successful brand logo because of it. So it's just something to be aware of. We're, we're, it doesn't even, you know, the Starbucks logo doesn't even say Starbucks. And we know it's Starbucks. You could be walking down the street and you can see that logo. No sign, nothing else. And you say, oh, that's, I can go get coffee there. That, you might not like the coffee, but the point is you recognize the logo. I've used a bunch in this lecture. I've used a bunch of real logos. And then I've thrown in some funny ones for the fun of it. Some, some like this, the Crocodile Hill. If I say that correctly, it's just kind of entertaining. So I'm going to throw some goofy ones in there just so you can see this whole idea of logos and how you come up with an idea that represents a brand. You know, I don't know. I think I would go to the fish bomb fishing shop. I think I would because it's kind of a cool logo. I'd probably want to go in there. 
something that's enduring. So you come up with a logo, and let's say you're a big time company, let's say you're Twitter. What happens in 10 years? Does your logo still work? Or does it become outdated? Is it future proof? Could your logo last for 10 years? Could it last for 20 years? Could it last for 50 years? And still feel current? And still feel reasonable to be used? That's certainly something that's important. So this was the original Apple computer logo. So can you imagine for a second that on the back of your phone, or on the back of your iPad, that was the logo? It's a little different. Is this an enduring, long-lasting logo? Not so much. It's not iconic. It doesn't grab your attention. It's kind of goofy. And I think it's a great example of how things change. So the first Apple logo was that one, which I just showed you. Then it went to the rainbow Apple logo. Some of you are old enough to remember this. Some of you are not old enough to remember this. This is really sad in my world. <laughs> I remember this. The, the rainbow Apple logo uh, was, was their logo for a long time, actually, from 1976 to 1998. That's a pretty good tenure for, for a logo. Um, and then the company basically almost died in 1998. And then Steve Jobs came back in and kind of rebranded everything. And they took the rainbow colors away, and they went to just the very black Apple logo. Notice the logo itself is actually the same. It's the same Apple. So Apple Computer, or Apple now, has had essentially the same logo since 1976. That's a really long time to have exactly the same logo. Now, have they tweaked it? Have they, did they go from the rainbow version to the black version to the shiny version to the not so shiny version, and now they're back to the flat version with no shine? Yeah, it's made some evolutions, but it's essentially the exact same logo for that whole time. That's part of having an established brand, is being able to have that kind of a logo last. There's the current Apple logo. So the logo design process, similar to all the rest of the design processes that we've talked about, we start with a design brief, then we get into research, followed by reference. Then it's the big con sketching, conceptualizing, figuring out what the logo should be, trying out different ideas, reflecting back. Is it working? Is it not working? And then finally, you're presenting it to the client, saying, this is your new logo. Do you like it? So here it is in terms of a little bit of time, Venn diagram style, where we have some overlap in time. And you see that the big circle is the sketching and conceptualization part. That takes the bulk of the work, because you have to figure out what the new logo is going to be in the first place. So we'll start in that first step, which is the design brief. This is where you're questioning whoever the client is. What do you want in a logo? What do you want to see? Is it, is it an image? Is it text? What, what is it? So you're questioning it. You're getting information about it. For today, you're going to be designing a logo for yourself. So you're questioning yourself. What do I want to see in my logo? What feels right for me? What's the intended purpose? Think about where it's going to be used. That's the other thing. And oftentimes, people create a logo, and they're not thinking about where it's going to be used. Is it going to go on a t-shirt? I went ice climbing in Switzerland one time, and they had the coolest shirts because they had this big spider on the back. It was awesome. The guy who designed the logo was obviously thinking about putting it on the back of a t-shirt. It was great. So think about that sort of thing. Where does it go? Letterhead, website, t-shirt, big billboard. Can your logo fit in those various components? It's also a good time to discuss how much you're going to get paid to do it. Well, guess what? You can work for yourself today. You can set your salary at whatever you want to pay yourself. Then you get into the research phase. So what industry does this logo belong in? If you're a designer, OK, well, you're in the design industry. Maybe you're an industrial designer. Maybe you're an architectural designer. It would pay to find out what are the other firms using as their logos. So if you're into architecture, what does SOM's logo look like? What does, uh, I don't know, you name it, you know, Norman Foster's logo look like? Rem Coolhouse. What are, what are all their logos? How, do your, how does yours fit into that? That's an important thing to understand. What other logos are used in the industry? For you guys as students, what are other students using as their logos? That doesn't mean copy it. It just means be aware of it. 
What is your history of previous logos? So a lot of you already took 130. You had to do a logo to go on your drawings. What did that logo look like? Just because you did that logo doesn't mean you have to do the same logo now. You're in the early stages of design. You're not stuck in a logo. You might, your first one might have been that Apple computer logo, and you say, yeah, I don't know. I don't want that one anymore. So you can change it. But start thinking about that. What are your competitors using for their logos? This is all research, getting that background information. Then we move into reference. There's a difference between research and reference. Research is about your industry and what are people doing in your industry. Reference is what are the global trends of logo design? What are other people doing in logo design? So big scale information. What are the current styles being used? Is it shiny? Is it rounded? Is it not rounded? I'll do a whole set of slides saying what the current trends are so you can see what the current trends are. And it's actually pretty entertaining because they're very different than what the 2017 trends were. They haven't published the 2019 trends yet. We haven't had enough time yet. Then we get into scheduling and conceptualizing. This is the most important big step is figuring out your ideas. And so get out your sketchbook and you draw. Today I would encourage you to flip the page over and draw on the back. There's nothing wrong with drawing by hand. And if you feel comfortable on the computer, draw on the computer. Get those ideas out. But it's never the first idea. It's always the hundredth idea that ends up being the really good one. Fall back on your research and reference steps so you can think about what it is that you learned, etc. Produce a bunch of ideas. This is a process, for example. So they started with a photograph. And I said, OK, well, I'm going to sketch it. This becomes this. Let's make it a little bit more graphic so we've simplified the shapes a little bit. Continuing simplifying the shapes. And OK, take it into Illustrator. Let's start to make those shapes in Illustrator. Start to orient those shapes. Get them adjusted. OK, it's starting to get somewhere. Maybe it needs a little bit more of a logo. Pick the right font. Typography important. And then it becomes a series of graphics. Thinking about where it might go, letterhead, business card, website, etc. So you can see how the process would go all the way through from a, just an early stage idea to having something that's kind of a finished product. Another example here, bunch of sketches trying to come up with the idea. So here it is, starting to create it in Illustrator. Thinking about color gradients. This one's kind of interesting because we're going through all the different colors. But they did a great job with the way the shadows work. Thinking font. These three fonts look almost the same, correct? Very close. But they're putting all of them up there saying, which one is the right one? Because there's always one that's better than the rest. And then you end up getting the final logo. I think one of the interesting things about this, and the part of the reason I like this slide so much, is they've actually thought about what's the color version, which is the one everybody thinks about. Let's see if I can draw. There we go. That one's easy. But what happens when you turn this into black and white? If you took the color version and just turned it into black and white, it wouldn't look that good. So they've done a separate grayscale black and white version where they have the same shape, but they just added these little white pieces to give it the three-dimensionality. So it's all gray with just those little white pieces. They got rid of the gradient altogether. So the logo's the same, but the evolution to the black and white, or the gray scale, is very different. It's not just take the colored version and make it black and white. So I think that's something that's good to point out and, and good to look at. Then we get into the reflection phase. Step away from your work and revisit it with a fresh perspective. Detach yourself from the work. Look at it as somebody new. What does it look like? Ask your neighbors and colleagues for their opinion. Believe it or not, in exercise 114 here, there is a step in this exercise that says, turn to your neighbor and ask them what they think. It's actually required that you talk to your neighbor. I know that's shocking. Some of you, it's easy. You talk all the time. But for the rest of you, <laughs> make sure you talk to your neighbor about it. Receive that feedback and let your ideas mature. Work through what are, what are some different variations that you might create from this. And I'm actually going to ask you to create some iterations in the process today. It was interesting. I had a student probably 
year ago, maybe two years ago, who worked really hard, created a great logo. She's like, oh, I love this logo. It looks fantastic. She turned to her neighbor and she said, what do you think of my logo? And they said, have you looked at the Beats logo for the headphones? She's like, no. So Google it. She looks at it. It's identical. Sometimes that happens. Same thing happened to me one time in, a, in an architecture project. I did this, all this work designing this project, uh, and I got to the final review. And they're like, did you see this project by so-and-so? I'm like, no. I'm like, yeah, you should go look at it. It's the same project, same thing. Happens. So turn to your neighbor. You need that perspective. You get invested. You think about your particular project. You're not seeing it as an outsider. Ask that outside perspective. So it's actually required that you do that. I love this one. The grab it with the little rabbit inside. It's kind of fun. Then you get to the presentation. So you've done a bunch of ideas. You think about which one is the best, and then you're going to present that idea to your client. We don't have a big presentation today because you're presenting it to yourself here. But if your client doesn't like it, guess what? You get to go back and keep working on it. That's kind of the way it works. Uh, the Mall of America is kind of an interesting take on a logo because they, they created a lot of variety in what happens. It's always a ribbon. It always says Mall of America in black. But all of the rest of the, the stuff that goes around it can alter and can change. And so they've thought about the logo in terms of how does it change over time? How does it evolve? How does it change by season, et cetera? So we've got several of the main logos up at the top, different variants on the same concept. Uh, and then we have different color schemes. We get into, and I know these slides are a little bit blurry, but we get into special times of year. You know, you've got 4th of July, you've got Valentine's Day, you've got Christmas, and how they change the logos to reflect those kinds of things. And also, how can they use the logo as an overall backdrop? So it's a really creative way of thinking about the logo beyond just, here's the one steady logo that's always going to be there, i.e. the way Apple would do it. Here's my Apple. That's it. So it's kind of a different evolution, and I think it's a good one to kind of think about. Learn from what brands succeed and why. So Nike, this is about as simple of a shape as you can possibly get. Yet it's completely brand recognizable. If I threw that up there with no text or anything on it, you guys would all know, oh, that's Nike. So it's extraordinarily brand recognizing, uh, recognizable. Um, and it's just, it's one of the most successful symbols uh, it has been out there. Typography is totally critical for your logos. Some logos don't have any type at all. Some logos are 100% type. That's all they are. And I'll show you some examples of those. And you can do that, but typically it's not, let me just go into my font list and pick a particular font and say, oh, that's my logo. Because typically it involves some kind of customization. Remember, fonts go out of fashion too. So you can't just pick papyrus and say, that's my logo, because it goes out of fashion. I love picking on papyrus. It's just, just there. Is the font going to go out of style? Does it reflect your particular business, i.e., don't use Comic Sans for a financial thing? We talked about that in the typography lesson. Um, you may have to make your own to get the best results. You can load custom fonts today if you need and feel like you want a custom font. And the little details matter, the kerning and the tracking and all those things that we talked about. Um, to get them just right. So all of these are just fonts. There's no actual logo to it. Coca-Cola is a great one. That's it. Just the font itself. Now, is that custom? Sure, absolutely. Somebody actually scripted that out. They didn't just pick the Coca-Cola font and suddenly it was there. NASA, for example, same thing. So these are all type-based logos, and they're recognizable. Disney. I struggled for a long time. I couldn't spell Disney because I thought it ended with a P. Like, as a kid, I never understood why it, was a, it ended with a P. But anyway, you get the idea. Because it's a very graphic sort of thing. So all of these are unique. You can create a font or, and you can create a logo that is very you. OK, you guys ready? Ready for mines? <coughs> Anybody see the hidden thing in here? If you see it, don't say it. Okay, the rest of you, you will never look at the FedEx logo the same way again. I promise you that. Boom. There's an arrow. 
So cool. They move stuff from one place to another. And inside their logo, there's an arrow moving things. OK, you didn't think it was as cool. <laughs> that kind of stuff, if you can do that in a logo, you're really good. Because that's what makes a logo really unique. Where you see it one way, and then suddenly there's something else that you see it. And I can never not see that arrow and say, oh, that's so cool, when I see a FedEx truck go by. And that's part of this brand recognition. Can you do that kind of thing? Let's say somebody came to you and said, I have a company. We're called Dynamic Dust. How do you create a logo of that? It's interesting. So sometimes it doesn't always work. And you have to come up with some kind of a strategy. Avoid the cliches. Don't go into the clip art library and pick clip art. Bad idea. Guess what? Everybody has the same clip art. It's obvious. No light bulbs for ideas, no globes for international. Yeah, they've, they've all been done. They've all been done. I love this main source, which if you look at the globe, has nothing to do with main. Main's not even on the globe. Those are the kinds of mistakes that don't work. Don't copy another logo. Right? If, you, if you took the swoosh, the Nike swoosh, and said, ah, this is my logo now, everybody would say, why did you take the Nike swoosh logo? Because it is their logo. Like, don't take the Coca-Cola font and write Grant Adams in Coca-Cola font. It doesn't work. So you need to make it unique. It needs to be you to be successful. This is one place where copying something else doesn't really work. Output files. We're going to work today 1,500 pixels by 1,500 pixels at 300 DPI as our output file. That's kind of a baseline. But remember, this is a vector-based graphic. So if we needed it to be bigger, we can scale it up. That's not a problem. So that's the good thing. Um, JPEG, PNG, 800 by 800. Uh, you could even make it really small, a 24 pixel by 24 pixel, one of those little icons that goes at the top of your web browser if you had your own website. So there's always a scale here. Make sure you save the Adobe Illustrator file in addition to the export files. Um, those are important. And think about black and white, grayscale, or color. Most of you will do a logo in color, but sometimes it's nice to think about what it would look like if it were in black and white or in grayscale. So I'm just flipping through a few more ideas. That one's just silly. And I think one of the things about logos is once you start concentrating on them, you realize they're everywhere. Like you can't look anywhere and not see logos. Here's another example going all the way through from the initial sketching phase. This must have been in like the year 2000 around the eBay Google boom where everybody was doing primary colors. Color theory, that's another, that's another lecture. We'll get to that. Um, And then we get to the final version, and then how it fits on business cards and that sort of thing. So let's look at logo design trends for 2018. I told you I don't have 2019 yet because they haven't published the article yet. Um, this comes from a website called logolounge.com. They're great. Uh, every year they publish the logo design trends for the year, and it's kind of fun to go back and see what people are doing. Uh, they have words that describe them. They have their reasoning. Uh, they're up in quotes in the upper corner, so this is the tumbled style. I don't necessarily know what they mean by these various words, but I'm just telling you. Um, but you can see really quickly, like this one has a lot of rounded edges. That's part of its uh, strategy. The parallelogram, where we have uh, things on, on edge, etc. Outlines, so each one of these has a big thick outline going around it. Modern religion, not sure why they called it that, but you get the idea uh, of their, their strategy here. This actually is kind of a big strategy or a big trend this year, these, these kinds of line drawings. <laughs> Neo-vintage, black and white hipster. They trademark or established Purple. It's kind of a cool word anyway. 
gold. The fatty fade, they're referring to the big gradient changes. So you're going uh, in a slow fade from one color to another. Linear fade. Field lines, again, kind of thick, fatty borders and that sort of thing in a lot of these. Cut. So little pieces that have been cut out. The serif redo. And punctuation. OK. So you guys can look at that Logo Lounge website for more example ideas. I'm going to switch over the recording, and we'll continue on in Illustrator. I didn't go that long, so we're going to go straight into Illustrator, and then you guys can take your break after uh, that. So give me a second to just switch over. All right, so on we go with the personal logo. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and open up Adobe Illustrator. And we'll wait for that to open. OK, and I'm going to go ahead and create something new. And on this one, we've been using the print version. I think I might pick the web version. Um, and I'm going to customize the width here to be 1,500 and the height to be 1,500. And so there it is, 1,500 by 1,500. It's a square. And I'll go ahead and click on Create. I'm not going to worry about my bleed in this because we're just creating a single logo here. There it is. And now I have my uh, artboard set up. This is the space that I have to work in to start to create my logo. And so as I start to think about this logo, I, I'm going to start drawing some of the basic shapes that would be my logo. Uh, so for example, uh, I would use my pen tool or even just the rectangle tool, depending on what it is that I'm trying to create. Uh, let's say I wanted to start with a uh, rectangle or a square. I can hold down Shift to keep this in proportion, say maybe something like that. Uh, and I could fill it with a color. So let's fill it with a color. We will discuss color theory a little bit later on. Uh, and I don't want there to be an outline, so I'm going to make sure that there's no outline on it. And now I have the start of an object. So there's a square. If I wanted to modify the object, let's say I wanted to have a, a little diagonal that went down on the bottom, I could go back in just like we did last class, like with the pen tool. I can use my direct select. I could select two of these endpoints, and I could drop them to make them into like a parallelogram, for example, if I wanted to. So remember, we have control of those endpoints. I could also use the pen tool to add an anchor point right there in the center. Then I could use the direct select tool, the white arrow, to move that anchor point down to create a bottom, for example. So you can see I'm starting to just manipulate the shape into what I want. I, could I have, could I have uh, started with just the pen tool and drawn the shape? Sure. So you guys practiced with the pen tool a lot last class, so you shouldn't be afraid to use the pen tool. So let's say that I have this kind of established. Uh, let's say I want to add something else on the inside. So let's say I want to go from here to there. Like that. And let me change the color here. Like that. I don't know that I like those colors just yet, but bear with me for a little bit. So I have these two shapes. Now let's say that, let me move this. Come on, go. Cool. There we go. Let's say that I wanted to adjust these two shapes, or I wanted to combine these two shapes. Um, or let's say that I wanted to have this shape cut out with this shape. I can use a tool called the Pathfinder tool. And so if I go up to Window and I choose Pathfinder, right here, these are options that let us combine shapes together. So let's say, actually, let me do it this way. Let me add a shape like this, because this will help illustrate the point a little bit. So let's say I wanted this red shape to have this cut out of it, this little notch right here. 
I can use the Pathfinder tools to achieve that. So if I select both of the shapes here, I can go over here to the shape modes and I could say subtract the front from the back. So if I click on that, it's going to get rid of this piece of my shape. That then becomes transparent. Let me have another uh, object here in a different color so that you can see that it's transparent. And back, there we go. So that now became transparent. I can see through it. I've created that little notch. Alternatively, I'm going to back up here for a second. There it is. I could take these two objects and I can add them together. And then that becomes one and I've added this shape. So without doing anything other than clicking the button, I've combined shapes together or I've subtracted from the shapes. I could get the intersection of the two shapes. So again, they're both selected. I could say, just leave me with the piece where those two shapes intersect. Or I could say, you know what, subtract the place where they're intersecting. So right there, get rid of just that one piece of it. So there's a lot of flexibility once you start using the Pathfinder in terms of how you can combine your shapes together. Those are all the shape modes that are up on top of our tools. Down here under Pathfinders, these are actually a, the same concept, but they're a little bit more advanced. So divide, for example, I end up getting all the pieces as separate objects. So this is separate from that, which is separate from the back, which got cut out. So it chopped up the objects. So there, one more. There we go. Not so far. OK, so I did that first one. This next one here is the trim, which basically cuts the back one out but leaves both the pieces. So I can then move those two. Uh, then here, this is merge. which makes the two objects, yeah, it cuts them out there. Uh, and then we have similar options where here, give me just the intersection of the two pieces, et cetera. You guys get the idea. So these are all how you would go about starting to, to formulate your particular logo. So I want you guys to experiment with that. Uh, but you're going to ultimately create your logo using a combination of the pen tools, the shape tools, et cetera. I'm going to move that over just a little bit, move this one over just a little bit. Sometimes making little adjustments using the arrow keys can be helpful because you can make small adjustments until you get it visually the way you want it to. About like that. And so I say, okay, I'm kind of, I'm kind of into this logo. I feel pretty good. Maybe it's time to add some uh, type to it. I can use the type tool. And I'll go ahead and say, you know what, I'm going to do each line of my name as a separate piece of text. There we go. We need to make those guys a little bit bigger. I'm going to select them. I can come over into my character styles and I can make them bigger here. So I can say I wanted them to be bigger there. The other option would be to use my uh, scale and just hold down shift and I could make it bigger that way. So let's say that I had that. Let's move this one down here. Move this one down a little bit more. Okay, so I have those two. Um, let's say that I wanted to, to skew those so that they were up on the same angle. Instead of just skewing the text itself, I'm going to go ahead and go to the Type menu and say Create Outlines. We did this one in um, InDesign. Same thing. That gives me an object here. I can then start to make my uh, rotations. Let me go ahead and go to my Direct Select. That gives me control over each one of these letters. I could make my adjustments to any one of the control points. So I could take these two and start to customize my particular font. The other option would be to take the whole thing and I can go up into my, um, where is it? 
We're going to go to Object and then Envelope Distort. We're going to make with a mesh. Uh, I don't want 4x4. Four four. I'm just going to do, uh, I think it's 2x2. Two two. Is it OK? It gives me, nope, I wanted 1x1. One, one. one more chain. Object, Envelope Distort, Make with Mesh. 1 by 1. And that will end up giving me control points on all four corners, which will allow me to take these two and pull them up like that. Uh, in this scenario, I need to adjust my tangent lines a little bit. Or I could take my um, control point. Will it let me do it? No, it's not going to let me do it. So I just need to adjust these guys. And I can start to create uh, my text that's on an angle, for example. So you can start to play around with, with these various strategies. Just like I did, I'm going to get rid of this for now. Just like I did with the Pathfinder tool, I could take this object, sorry, use my regular selection tool, this object and this object, and I could subtract the top object from the bottom object. I love it when it doesn't do what I want it to do. Well, I have to go back and figure it out. I should, if it was just the regular text without the envelope distort, so here it is with regular text and this object, I should be able to go right into my, oh, come on. I have not changed. I haven't done the create outlines. There we go. Now with the create outlines, I have this and this, and I can subtract that from that, and I can get that to cut out if I wanted to. So there's, there's flexibility there. I'm not quite sure where the envelope distort doesn't want me to, uh, to do the cutout. I should be able to do that as well. It's probably something to do with committing to the envelope distort. But I'll have to go and, and sort that one out. So your, your goal today is to start to build out your particular logo. Uh, you have the Pathfinder tools. You have the pen tools. You're going to work through it. One thing that I want to show you as well that I didn't show you last class is that once you create an object with the pen tool, uh, let me do, I'm going to create a new layer so I can hide the old one. There we go. So let's say that I'm creating that logo again. Or maybe a slightly different logo. This probably would take a little bit more adjustment, but let's say that it's like that. So I have a, a line that's been drawn here. I want the line itself to have a stroke, but not fill. So right now it has fill. I'm going to flip the two. And then I'll change the color so that you guys can see it a little bit better to black. And I will change the stroke. And go to Window, and then Stroke here. And I'm going to increase that so you can see it a little bit better. There you go. So you can all see it. So I've started to create that logo. But I can, let's say that I wanted the width of this line to vary. So there's something called the width tool that is underneath the, it's right here. It looks kind of like a banana slug. And if I pick on that, I can actually control the width at any point. So I could take this point, and if I click, hold, and drag, I can make that point of my line thicker or I could make that point of my line thinner. Likewise, I could click, hold, and drag and make that point a little bit thicker. And so I can start to customize it. There are the ability, let me go in the stroke menu here. I need to show my options so that I have all my options. Down here at the very bottom is something called profile. And this profile allows you to pick from presets. So if I wanted it to slowly taper, from thick to thin, I could use that profile. It would slowly taper. I want to flip it so it's thickest in the middle here. And then I need to adjust the, the line thickness down. And 
And so in that scenario, you can see that it starts thick and works its way down to thin as you go through the course of that line. If I had a line that was a little bit more, sorry, curving, like that, some of these other, sorry, I need to make it big enough so you to see. Sometimes you want to have it, see how it, it gets thick, then it gets thin, then it gets thick again. That's another strategy for as you start to create your particular logo. So let me come down here, turn that off. Let me create a new one. Like that, I can thicken this up. Then I could apply one of these presets, something like that. And then you can see that it goes from thin to thick and then back to thin. And then I could start to, to work with that uh, as part of my particular logo. Maybe I add type or whatever. So that's the width tool. That's another thing that you're, you're able to do. Uh, generally, that works with just um, a line or a curve, not a closed shape. So if I did something like this, I can technically apply it, but it's a little bit, it generally doesn't have as much effect, but it is something that you could do if you wanted to. So I have that, uh, and I could adjust the width independently too in any given spot if I wanted it to get a little bit different. So same thing here, if I wanted this to get a little bit fatter in one place, I could do it that way and make my adjustments. So there's always flexibility there. So I wanted to make sure I showed you the width tool. I've showed you the Pathfinder tool. Um, I talk a little bit about color palette. I would hold off on that until next class. We'll, we'll discuss color palettes in a lot of detail uh, next class. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I think the rest is fairly self-explanatory. So I'm going to let you guys get started. Uh, if you run into any issues, let me know. Remember that you do need to ask your neighbor. It's part three, talk to your neighbor. That's required today. You must talk to your neighbor and ask them what they think, get some feedback, and then make your adjustments. At the end of class, I'm asking you to uh, pick your favorite logo, because you may end up creating more than one today. Pick your favorite one. That's the one that you're going to post. You should comment on this exercise. And um, that's about it. If you have any questions, let me know.